In the 20th century, perhaps the greatest block to Christianity was precisely a spiritual complacency, a sense that all in us is basically in order. But when this attitude is internalized, Jesus necessarily devolves to the level of teacher or inspiring hero and ceases to be savior. Hence the moment, necessarily painful, when grace breaks through our defenses, is an epiphany worth describing. To my mind, the best presentation of this breakthrough in O'Connor's writings is the pithy, funny, and deeply troubling story called, appropriately enough, Revelation. The narrative begins with the entry of Mr. and Mrs. Turpin into a doctor's crowded waiting room. The place is filled with sick people, but the plump and self-possessed Mrs. Turpin is not one of them. She is quick to tell everyone that it's her husband who has the appointment. As the story progresses, Flannery allows us to hear two conversations. The outer one that Mrs. Turpin is having with the other denizens of the waiting room, and the inner one that she's having with herself. On the outside, everything is warm and pleasant and generous. But on the inside, Mrs. Turpin is fiercely judging everybody in the room. When a lady tells her that she had bought some jewelry with green stamps, Mrs. Turpin says to herself, ought to have got you a wash rag and some soap. When a young woman, slouching in the corner, is described as having been to college up north, Mrs. Turpin thinks to herself, well, it hasn't done much for her manners. All of this comes to a head when Mrs. Turpin utters a soliloquy of gratitude for all the gifts that God had given her. If it's one thing I am, it's grateful. When I think who all I could have been besides myself and what all I got, I just feel like shouting, thank you, Jesus, for making everything the way it is. With that, a book hits her directly over her left eye. It had been thrown by the scowling college girl who is now on Mrs. Turpin, her fingers digging into the soft flesh around our hero's throat. The doctors, the nurses, the attendants spring into action. They pull the girl off of Mrs. Turpin. They administer a sedative. But before slipping into unconsciousness, the young woman fixes Mrs. Turpin with a fierce stare. The older woman realizes that the frightening figure before her knows her in some personal and intense way. Both fascinated and terrified, Mrs. Turpin sputters, what you got to say to me? Continuing to stare into Mrs. Turpin's face with awful concentration, the girl says, go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog. Despite the horrified protests of the denizens of the waiting room, Mrs. Turpin realizes in some uncanny but definitive way that the girl is right. The words of the unmannered college student carried the force of a revelation. As the unconscious girl is being carried away, we understand the power of her name. Mary Grace. Like the Pharisee in Jesus' famous parable, who thanked God for making him not like other men, Mrs. Turpin exulted in her moral superiority. In fact, it was upon that sense that her whole relationship to God was based. Like a tortoise or a terrapin, how like Turpin, she had encased herself in a protective shell. The needful thing was a breakthrough and it was provided through the ministrations of Mary Grace. 
In a fallen world, God's love is typically experienced in this interruptive, even violent way. O'Connor's stories compel us to look with the eyes of faith precisely at these unnerving moments. What we see at the close of the story is that Mrs. Turpin's revelation has in fact prompted a decisive change. Standing alongside the hog pen on her farm, how like the prodigal son who had fallen to the point of working among the pigs, Mrs. Turpin looks up and spies a curious purple streak. As a visionary light sparkles in her eyes, she saw the streak as a vast swinging bridge extending upward from the earth. Upon it, a vast horde of souls were rumbling toward heaven. There were whole companies of white trash, clean for the first time in their lives, battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs. And taking up the rear of the procession of the blessed were people like her husband and herself, proper and dignified. But she saw, and the story ends with this luminous observation, by their shocked and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. We recall Jesus' admonition to the Pharisees. Amen, I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven before you. He's not saying that the self-righteous will never get in, but he's certainly implying that those who acknowledge their need for salvation are walking the privileged path. 